bum 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 bum
underestimated how much our conversations about comics through the lens of like self-help and counseling vocabulary would really give vocabulary to and define and shape my worldview. Mm -hmm. And there are definitely a few touchstone conversations that I find myself going back to mentally and spiritually where I go like, okay, this really does define me. Like our conversation with Swamp Thing, talking Alec and Abby yes. through the lens of common and let's love let love have the last word. Agreed. And that idea of Swamp Thing is not Alec Holland. You, Lisa Gullickson, are not your past self. Yes. And that removal, that separation from every other iteration of myself has really given me space to forgive my past self, to learn from my past self in a way that is not defensive, it's just like loving. And I don't think that would have happened without Alan Moore giving me this and Common giving me this vocabulary. Yeah. Like I am not Alec Holland. I am not my high school self. Yeah, I mean, you you literally are not. Your cells are different, mm-hmm, right? You mm-hmm. are a different creature. You're and a every, different thing than that other Lisa. And because I am different, that doesn't mean that I can relate to that person. And that doesn't mean that I know intimately the way I thought in high school or yeah, whatever, or yeah. in college. That was definitely an arc of episodes that sprung to my mind when I was thinking about this question myself. I go all the way back to our very first couple series on Scott Summers and Jean Grey and using Gary Chapman's The Five Love Languages. Now, that book I took some umbrage with. Mm-hmm, yes. There's a lot of problems in The Five Love Languages that, I, that don't speak to me, but the vocabulary that it gave us, those five love languages that (laughs) since 2018, those, those love languages have routinely come up in our conversations. And this idea that your partner might be showing you love in ways that you don't see because they're speaking a different love language. Like, I mean, that has helped me in our relationship. That has helped me in my familial relationships. Like, And if you start taking acts of service as love, gifts as love, any kind of words of affirmation and acknowledgement as love, that means that we have love coming at all times from all directions if we choose to see it that way. Yeah. And of course, like, we do now have the vocabulary of going like, my love tank is a little low. I could use, <laughs> let, let's seek out some words of affirmation. Let's reach out. Like, and, and it also empowers us to ask for love. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And seek it out. And it gives you the tools when you want to help others to engage with their love tank, you mm-hmm. know, not to sound crass. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but like words of affirmation in particular, those have become incredible tools in my uh, Mjolnir uh, toolbox. An- another thing that I find myself going back to comes from our conversation about Thanos and death using Brene Brown's Daring Greatly. Just the idea of inviting v- vulnerability mm. and th- and and seeing it as this incredibly brave thing to bear out. And then also her idea of hope not being an emotion, but being a cognitive process. Mm. In order for someone to feel hope, you have to offer them a way out of their situation. Despair happens when there is no plan. Yeah. The other thing I took out of that Brene Brown conversation is the idea that you are writing a narrative Mm. every day and you can become a prisoner of that narrative like Thanos did in his relationship with death. Just having in our tool belts the phrase... And this is the story I'm telling yes. myself. Yes. Like, you know, <laughs> that when comes up a lot between us. <laughs> when, whenever we're having some kind of disagreement or we are inferring something from our partner's behavior, yeah, yeah. being able to go, like, well, the story I'm telling myself is that 
you're not going to the grocery store because you want to teach me a lesson about preparedness. <laughs> and you know, and like, that might not be true, or it could be true. Or it could be it true. It could be true. We need to talk about it. And some of some of my lessons don't just come from don't come from the combination of the expert and the comic. Sometimes they just come from the comic themselves, like our Loki and Loki episode with Journey into Mystery. That idea of Holding the Twilight Pen. Yes. That's like another oh. uh, lesson about narrative. Thank you, Kieran Gillen. Uh, yeah, the idea of like by being in the present, you are actively writing your story. Yeah, and, and we tied that into our Brene Brown conversation and Thanos and Death. Mm -hmm. That was so fun. That was very fun. Uh, yeah, I was thinking about our conversation around Reed and Sue about 50 episodes ago using the four tendencies Gretchen as our Rubin, love yes. expert. And the, I, it, like to me... Uh, it's not even like my tendency that I ended up getting labeled. I think about your tendency mm -hmm. as an obliger and the idea of obliger rebellion. Like you get to a point and you're, you rebel against your tendency. Yeah. Like I, 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 I think about that a lot. Uh, and, and I see how, even though I may not be an obliger, I do experience obliger rebellion. Where you feel like you have humored someone too far or you've already yes. taken too much on and you're like, well, if I if I can't do everything I need to do, then I'm going to do nothing. Table and flip. Table flip. flip. <laughs> Let's move. Let's change our names. I just want to witness a crime so I can go into protection. <laughs> yeah, and, and so this episode has been, you know, this podcast has been the world to us and, and it has been our world for the last nearly three years. And I can't imagine life without it now and everyone listening and the comments we get from listeners mm -hmm. about how these conversations are helping them in their relationships. Like it's, it's it funny. And I'm going to say something corny. Oh, give me the space. I'm going to be vulnerable. Brene we Brown. Do, we do corny here. <laughs> like we went into this podcast with the conceit of like, oh, we are going to counsel these comic book characters right. we are going to use our experience as this functional couple with the help of these experts to tell them how to live their lives yeah we used to end the episodes like do we think the this couple uh, do gonna we think make they're it? gonna make it and we don't even use that language anymore we don't well, honestly here it comes let's do it it's the comics that have been counseling us where the the comic books have taught us so much about our relationship and then using the love experts to give us that tool belt, to give us the vocabulary, to give us the the, the space to even talk about yeah. like how we feel our relationship is functioning and, and do we think we're going to make it? Yeah. How, like, are we going, can our relationship become even more functional or do we see our relationship getting less functional? How can, do we have the tools to save it? Like, yeah, yeah. I mean, this, this podcast has become such a celebration of the art form, the medium mm -hmm. that is comic books. And, you know, these stories have been incredible gifts to us. And also the art form of keeping relationships because it really do, it really is a, a skill and a practice. Yeah, practice. Yeah, we say practice a lot. We say a practice a lot here, Lisa. Um, but I don't want to like wrap up this section of like, yay, comic book couples counseling, <laughs> happy 150th birthday without like highlighting maybe some couples that we've covered that have surprised us, couples that we weren't expecting to oh, cover sure. that kind of just like we've become obsessives of. Okay, well then let's just start with Angela and Sarah. Our last couple, yes. This is one of the couples that have been requested <laughs> often, particularly by Almost. two listeners who have been with us practically from the beginning, yes, yes. Max and Jamie. Yeah. And like when you have people who love these characters, it feels like the stakes are high yeah. that, okay, we have to love these characters too, and sometimes the pressure just like feels like too much. Which is why we probably kept pushing <laughs> Angela and Sarah down the road to cover. But honestly, those last three couple sessions were so wonderful. Angela and Sarah were so um, educational for us, so, so reflecting for us. The way that they celebrated each other, celebrated their relationship, and then also how their relationship changed whenever they were under pressure. How they kind of expressed things in a way that 
like at different times we would feel like contrary just because, you know, it's a lot being a, f- a fallen angel who's responsible from, for getting your <laughs> girlfriend out of hell. Like it's yeah. a lot. In our last conversation about them discussing Angela, Queen of Hell, uh, written by Marguerite Bennett, art by Kim Hacento and Stephanie Hans, there's a moment where the characters discover that they have to choose each other mm. and that it is a practice, a regular practice that you have to choose each other over and over again. And that is something that I have been noodling on this past week a lot. Mm. Uh, and so, you know, uh, we have to thank JB and Max for our Angela and Sarah sessions. But I also want to shout out one of my favorite couples, a couple I never thought we would ever cover on Comic Book Couples Counseling. And that was Wen and uh, Carmen yes. from The Second Life of Dr. Mirage. The most functional couple ever on comic book couples counseling recommended to us by mike thompson from the mm-hmm. 10 cent takes podcast and those 18 issues those precious only 18 issues like you know like those valiant comics they're not like the best comics in the world but that couple that couple is one of the best couples in comics they have a, well one thing the valiant comics have their charm they have For their sure. place yes and i think that those dr mirage comics even with the hard bodies and the weird sex, like <laughs> I really found them entertaining. <laughs> uh, any other couples that we just want to like go? Uh, like, if oh, we're going to talk about episodes. precious couples for which there is not enough material oh, yeah, of, yeah, 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 yeah. Hercules and Logan from oh, Extreme X Men. Oh, I love those two. We did one episode on them, and I wish we could do like twenty episodes on them. Uh, on that front, I would also say Nathaniel and Benji from yes. Generation X. What are they doing? They've got to be out there somewhere. They're on Krakoa. Yeah. I need more stories of theirs. Uh, yeah, um, I would also like. You've already mentioned Abby and Swampy. We've mentioned Norn and Don. They're responsible for this podcast. Uh, Ollie and Dinah, mm, our Green so Arrow series. Fun. That's one of my favorites. Harley and, and Ivy. Oh, Harley and Ivy. Harley yeah. and Ivy. They're a couple that I'm excited to like dip back into. Okay. okay. As material comes out. Yeah, because we've covered a lot, but there are couples that we would like to return to. Harley and Ivy are definitely that. Any others? Uh, Peter and MJ. Oh, yeah, for sure. Yeah. Yeah, yeah like, that's got to happen. One, I was not in love with the love expert that I chose uh-huh. for them because uh-huh. I was trying to do like a... Uh, I can't even Myers Briggs yeah. related, and it just it was, didn't work. It was I I still love those episodes, <laughs> yeah. but I feel like uh, Peter, the Parkers deserve better. Yeah, I I cherish our one more day episode. Mm, That's yes. one of my favorite episodes. But I do think like we we could easily cover Ultimate Spider-Man since mm-hmm. we've got Bendis here. You know, yeah. <laughs> that's got to happen. But I think a lot of these like legacy couples like Reed and Sue, even Scott and Jean, yep. any of the X-Men couples and any of their myriad of iterations. We're getting more and more requests for Schema, Lisa, Scott and Emma. But I'm saying there are couples that we need to do second season. Yeah, 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 yeah. Scott and Jean. Mm-hmm. We'll, we, we'll, we'll, we'll return to them uh, probably maybe for our 200th episode, it feels like that's... That, and that of course, okay. we need to do our double dip on Lois and Clark, because surely a couple <laughs> that huge, we would have covered it already by our 150th <sighs> episode. We'll get to Lois and Clark someday, <laughs> I'm Elliot. trolling. I'm trolling, Elliot. <laughs> uh, but we're going to do Superman and Wonder Woman first. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but yeah, so I don't know. We just spent 20 minutes celebrating comic book couples counseling. And those are just our couple sessions. We have had so many... Beautiful, incredible, insightful, yeah. lesson-yielding creators on our show. And what I've loved about our Creator Corner conversations, like the one you're all about to hear right now, is I feel like you and I have a different take and a different perspective on these types of interviews. And we've gotten some really special and and I'm going to keep saying the word precious, some precious material out of these creators. If you go back and you listen to our chats with Jeff Smith about Tukey and Bone and Stan Sakai about Samurai Rabbit and Usagi Yojimbo, uh, uh, you know, oh, Garth Ennis and Scott Snyder. Like there, there are, we've talked to so many cool people that it would, it would be embarrassing to list them all right now, but we thank all, all of them. And thank you for all of the lessons that you've taught yeah, us. Yeah. Um, yeah. A lot of you shared your life philosophies, your your creative 
um, motivations. And it's just like, it really informs us. It really, you know, fleshes out the way that we see the world. Yeah. Uh, so uh, fleshes oh. out the way we see the world. That sounds like we're seeing the world in the nude, which is the way we <laughs> want to see it. We want everything in the buff. Yeah, that's right. Uh, and we're only going to get more conversations with rad creators as we go along. Uh, yeah. So um, thank you for hanging out with us. Thank you for in indulging us in that little celebration yeah. we just had. It's, Celebrating ourselves seems really indulgent. Uh, it's emotional. It's yeah. an emotional thing to get to episode 150. And here's to another 150 and beyond. Yeah. But we really need to get to the heart of this episode, our conversation with Andre Lima Arujo and Brian Michael Bendis about their new comic from Abrams Comic Arts, uh, Phenomena, The Golden City of Eyes, a young adult book. Um, This comic book... I, I mean, it really does not look, sound, or feel like any comic book that these two creators have done before. And it seems to me from our conversation that it is the di direct result of two creators inspiring each other and then making exactly what they want. <laughs> yes, yes. And, and what's fascinating about it is that both creators seem to approach material from polar opposites. Mm -hmm. uh, phenomena is, despite what we said in our intro, not about an apocalypse. Uh, in their little uh, synopses, it reads something far more interesting than an apocalypse. And the first volume puts all the mystery out there. And I guess what we're going to get in the second and third volume is some more definition of exactly what happened on Earth. But what you get in The Golden City of Eyes is a trilogy of heroes making their way through this very weird landscape and having fun while doing it. Like, it is not a morose story in any way. It almost feels like, to me, the reason that the apocalypse happens is almost a moot point. Yes, like, I the agree. most fun you have is with our three. Our merry band of misfit protagonists. One of the things that I've been thinking about a lot this week as well is in She-Hulk, the latest episode on Disney Plus, or actually, no, in the premiere of She-Hulk, Bruce Banner describes his time with Tony Stark during the blip as a good time and a bad time. Mm. And that is also at the center of phenomena. And Brian Michael Bendis talks about that a lot in this conversation you're about to hear. It's an extremely optimistic take on how we would continue to try to function when everything that holds our structure together falls apart. Right. And one of the ways that the world has fallen apart and we are trying to hold it together is I guess... Um, any kind of infrastructure having to do with like monetization has yeah, fallen yeah, apart. Yeah, yeah. Their um, money no longer has value. So instead, they trade stories. And these stories have more um, have more weight, the more, more worth, more worth, the more extraordinary and factual yeah. they are. Yeah, they don't want any fiction. But because, they don't want fiction. There is counterfeit. Yes. yes there yes. is counterfeit. <laughs> and I got very stuck on this. You'll hear in this interview, I got very stuck on this concept. And they're like, you are very stuck on this concept. And I'm like, you are correct. <laughs> and you got to wait for the second volume. <laughs> wait for the, I'm like, I want all of the answers now, please. And thank you. Yeah, But it's like, it's a very, like I said, it's a very fun comic with a trilogy of heroes. We have Bolden and Spike and Matilda. They all have very distinct and clashing personalities. They all look incredible. The, the comic itself, like if you've seen Andre Lima Arujo's art, if you've read Righteous Thirst of Vengeance, like, like he is a hyper de detailed stylist. And that is all there in this book, cranked to 11 and in black and white. And it is stark and crazy beautiful. This book is extremely art forward. And, and this is true for all comics, but like... So much of the storytelling is in taking your time with the art. But what you will learn is that uh, Andre, 
he works really damn fast mm -hmm. in comparison to how crazy detailed the art is. And then, of course, you get Brian Michael Bendis's dialogue, which is so natural, so bubbly, so funny. And I think we get a level of introspection yep. that I think is really special. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's like, like this is a book where you just want to get it into as many people's hands as possible. Mm -hmm. And as long as that happens, uh, people are going to take notice of it. Now, uh, a few things you need to know about this conversation before it starts is that Brian Michael Bendis was late to the party. Mm -hmm. Contrary to his character, <laughs> he is a very punctual person. <laughs> and contrary to his calendar. <laughs> uh, but the first 20 minutes of this conversation, and yes, this is an hour long conversation. We're spoiled. The first 20 minutes is with Andre, and it is uh, a, a lot about the process and creation of phenomena. And then Lisa starts the conversation about storytelling and value and worth. And that's when Brian Michael Bendis joins us at about the 20 minutes minute mark and then we get like real wild and in-depth and it, th this is one of my favorite conversations that we've had on this show and uh, I'm, I'm just excited for you all to listen to it. There is one moment that I want to prepare you for <laughs> and it's very defensive and weird of me and Brad is like do you really want to put that in the intro and I'm like yes. <laughs> if any of you don't know my history with comics um I read comics a little bit before Brad, but I was not like a weekly reader. You were not a Wednesday warrior. I certainly was not. And when we got married, like I had a couple of false starts trying to commit to reading comics just because it's it's hard to find like there are so many comics and it's hard to find something that finally hooks you and also kind of ingratiated me into how particularly superhero comics function. Yes. And so I just kind of randomly picked from our shelf, like, this is a series I am going to read in completion. I mean, it is the most prominent series on our shelves. It's mm -hmm. in our living room right by our television. It's a giant wall of Ultimate Spider-Man hardcovers. Right. So I just started with the first one and and I read that Ultimate Spider-Man run and I reread the origin of Spider-Man even though I had seen the films and um, And spoilers for Ultimate Spider-Man. But somebody perishes in that book. Yeah. So I and I found myself so emotionally involved in this comic and really involved in the relationship between MJ and Peter Parker. And when I'm a very emotional person, and when Peter Parker died, I was destroyed. Yes, I was it like was ugly. weeping. I was like, I, you know, I lay, I like, I remember getting to that point because I was, I, I just laid down on the carpet and cried into my own ears. I remember the day vividly. I was devastated and. I had to like take a break from comics. And I was like, Lisa, no, no, keep going, keep going. The series is gonna address and your I grief. And I did, I did eventually continue. And Brad was very good about not spoiling anything right. for me. Yep. But I had to take a moment to process those emotions. Now in my condensed version of Starstruck trying to tell Brian Michael Bendis this story, <laughs> I made it sound like I was so offended that he would kill Peter Parker that I quit reading comics. And and I know that anybody who has ever written Spider-Man knows how much criticism you get all, it's very perilous to write a beloved character. And you, you get a little defensive. And so- We he, talked about that with Chip Zdarsky about his Batman run. Yes, yeah. yes. And um, as a Dan Slott fan, we know <laughs> we know that his handling of Spider-Man is very controversial. Yes. So yes, so the way that um, Brian Michael Bendis humbly deflected <laughs> my compliment was saying like, yeah, you sound like everybody on Twitter. And <laughs> and I took offense at that, even though that is exactly the way I told the story. So I want you guys to know <laughs> that it was not out of offense that he would write such a thing. It was because I was so entirely moved by the love story that I just didn't want to see it end. I, I just edited the conversation, Lisa. I think all of that comes through. I hope so. I You know, the last thing I want to look like is a, 
is a Twitter troll. <laughs> You're not a Twitter troll. I what's the opposite of a Twitter troll? I'm like a Twitter rabbit where um I don't move. <laughs> and then when someone sees me, you I run quickly away. run. <laughs> uh, on that note, I think we just need to get into this conversation with Andre. I'm like Andre. sweating just thinking about my embarrassment in that moment. No, no. I'm sure it was good. fine. You're we fine. had a we had a a, bri- a brief email exchange after that not related but it made me feel much better okay good 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 let's get into our chat now with andre and brian about phenomena the golden city of eyes enjoy everyone share it with your friends and family and let us know what you think about it happy 150th episode andre thank you so much for joining us at comic book couples counseling we're super excited to have you in our love nest oh thank you very much for for having me brad and lisa it's a pleasure to be here, and I love the name of your podcast. <laughs> oh, thank you, thank you, thank you. Uh, not as much as we love Phenomena. Uh, this oh. book is absolutely incredible. Uh, all the cliches I can throw at it. Like, it's a feast uh, for it's the stunning. eyes. It's absolutely stunning. Uh, it, it, like, we were saying um, before we hit record on this conversation, we found ourselves reading through Phenomena very quickly, and we had to, like, stop rewind slow down and really take in each of your panels because you do not skimp on any detail <laughs> well thank you yeah like i um like we, like you, you said we we briefly talked about this before hit recording i do like to really craft the storytelling part well so make sure everything flows really nicely so it's very good to me that you you feel like you 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 were going fast through the reading because that's the purpose of good storytelling i guess to make you go with the flow control a little bit of the pacing but also i like to add as much things as i possibly can um when the storytelling part is solid enough you know so that we can flesh out the world on the backgrounds on the surroundings of the characters on the characters themselves the things that they carry the things that they do the way that they move what's behind them, what's in front of them, what's around them. So all of that I like to take good care of. Um, as much as it doesn't uh, then meddle with uh, the storytelling part or drags things down or adding things just for the sake of adding. It's like story is always king for me. So, but, but I'm very appreciative of you saying that. I, you know, it's clear to us just looking at the book uh, that it must take a tremendous amount of time. And I'm just wondering, like, how long ago did you start on Phenomena, the like actual illustration process? <laughs> so this book for people that um, are not aware have been, has been done for a while now. I did a, another book with Rick Remender called The Righteous Thirst for Vengeance. Yeah. That is finishing right now, is wrapping next. The last uh, issue is going to come soon. And uh, like when I started the Righteous Thirst, Phenomena was done. So I started this in like late 2019 and I finished it, it up like uh, a year later. Okay. So, so that, yeah, that accounts with like everything that you see in the book from, from I, we did a lot of, and we can go into the, because I think it's one of the most interesting bits is like how we came up with Phenomena yeah. because we came up with it through conceptual art and character designs before the plot and all that. So I did all of that. That includes that, the covers, all, all of it. It was just like a, a year of work, I think. Yeah. I mean, I, I do want to get into that, but like, I, I am surprised how fast you can illustrate something like Phenomena because it is so intensely detailed and rich. Yeah, I am uh, reasonably fast, I think. I think that I am pretty fast taking into account the type of stuff that I'm, the, the type of work that I do. And usually people are surprised when they are working with me, like how fast things start coming up. My my method of work is just, you never stop. Just I keep, you know, I take advantage of all the moments that I can in order to get the type of book that I want. And I also don't want to linger forever in one book or in one issue, you know, I want to get things moving. So I like to accumulate pages in a fast pace, kind of. So I draw like, for reference, I draw like 10 ink pages in two weeks. Mm. Then I will put the gray tones 
which is usually like um, a week or so for 20 pages. That's how I work. That's that's surprising to me. <laughs> I, I, like, I find it really interesting that the story came after like setting the tone for the visuals because phenomena takes place in this like post phenomena event on earth. And like, as I'm reading, I'm going, Ooh, that, that is clearly like earth technology. And maybe that came from elsewhere. So do, did you take your images and then like contextual and with Brian help contextualize why things look the way that they look? Yeah, it's a bit like like that. Like the, when we started, the, for context, is what because it is important to understand how the, the book really was born was because I was dying to make create your own stuff. I had done two books in twenty when twenty nineteen arrived. I, I had done two books at that point it was Men Plus, which I wrote and I drew, and Generation Gone, which is written by Alice Scott and drawn by me. It was created by both of us for Image. None of them sell very much, enough at least for me to keep doing that. But I had at that point when I met Brian, like um, I think 10 complete pitches of uh, different sizes uh, of stories that I was pitching around. And um, when Brian asked me to, Brian met me because he invited me to work on uh, the launch of DC Millennium, the book for... Um, Legion, Legion of Superheroes. Yeah. He did a special, a two-part special called Millennium that uh, had um, a different artist to draw five pages each or something like that. So I drew those five pages with him and I immediately said, listen, I really enjoy this. We need to do more together. Because I was a bit tired of doing, I had done pretty much everything you could do at Marvel at that point. And I wanted to do more created own. And he told me, Listen, I really like this as well. This is my phone number. Call me tomorrow. So we talked. And he said, basically, do you want to do something at DC or something creator owned? And I want. I said, I want to do creator owned immediately. And I sent him all my pitches for him to look like, to look at. And he was going to send me his ideas. But when he saw my stuff, he said, let's do something brand new. None of my ideas and none of yours. And instead, let's get all of this stuff that you want to get out of your chest and just put it out there. And that's how it basically began. Then he, he said that he had uh, all my pitches that sparked him an idea, which was the very fundamental basic idea of phenomena that was, that he wrote me in an email, which, which was like two lines, something like that. With those two lines, I started drawing stuff. And after like two or three drawings, he like I, I hit something and I told him, I really like it, he said, I really like that as well. So I started drawing more characters and more things around, you know, everything was based on what was, was done already for me. And he hadn't written much yet. Mm -hmm. Like he was feeding on all of those images and putting all of that stuff together. And uh, I remember that he only asked me, like, give me a kid and a creature. So the two main characters, Spike and Bolden, mm -hmm. that was asked by him. And I added the girl, Matilda. I had that one and I said to him, I want to draw this one as well, as much as possible. I really like her design. Like there is a group of uh, guys that are chasing our heroes on this story called Majestics, for example. That's mm. four guys that I drew on the same page, but they were not related to each other. Mm -hmm. But he picked that page and said, okay, this, this is a group of villains that is going to chase our heroes. So, you know, and then he told me um, that like, like, it leaves a lot of stuff open so that I can go back to my conceptual art and pick one drawing. And this is where this scene is set. And I go from there. You know, so there's a lot of that, like, he doesn't um, meddle with the artwork itself. He's not asking me for this, that direction, this and that. And I'm not asking him for specific stuff on the plot. I just give him some bits to contextualize why I drew what I, why I drew. And then sometimes he uses some of those bits and sometimes he just uses it for something completely different. And the fun of this is like, this is two worlds colliding, my world and his world. Is it an outline that comes together first and then you go off and do the art? Is he giving you a script? Like what is this Marvel style? What's the actual no. process? Once, so once we had the, first like it was like 40 drawings 
that's what he had in hand in hand he went and he wrote the story okay the actual plot and he gave me a script that was full script yes and some bits i changed completely some other bits he said okay page 12 to page 26 it's a fight do whatever you want mm-hmm. um like it's in the, on the first chapter from pages i can't even remember but i have it right here next to me <laughs> it's when they are uh, running away from that ball with tentacles oh yeah yeah so that bit like that, that was not scripted i made that up entirely and uh, so around page 20 something to page 30 something that bit and like he left that open on purpose to me he just said oh think about uh tintin the movie you know spielberg mm-hmm. movie animated yeah. movie because we both love that movie so much we keep talking about it and uh that was my basic frame of mind was something fun and uh exciting and that was the tone for for it all and then other bits is exactly like he scripted and mm-hmm. But a lot of the stuff that you see on the backgrounds, like the city where they are in, the city where they began, it's not written at all. It's not described what it is, but the city when they when Spike and Bolden meet, so it's Toronto, and that was uh, Brian that he wrote down, that he wanted to be that one. Mm. So there are things that he writes and other things that he doesn't write. That's how it goes. If he has something specific, he will do it. And if I have some something specific, I will do it. If it collides and it doesn't work together we will decide i i feel like there are many influences feeding phenomena yeah. from a, a narrative point of view but also from a visual point of view and you have yeah. some characters in the book that resemble some iconic cartoonists and i oh, yeah. i won't spoil who they are you won't? well i mean i guess i'll first i want to confirm <laughs> and i'll either include this in the podcast or i won't but you have the elders at the end of Mm -hmm. book one and one is definitely Miyazaki yeah one is Mobius yeah and the other is Kirby correct yes that's correct yeah okay okay (laughs) and 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 is you know is that um a knowing wink from you exclusively from you and Bendis like no that's Brian that's Brian yeah, Brian asked for that, knowing that how much I love Miyazaki and um, Moebius. And he, he like, and Kirby is more his kind of stuff. So he asked for those specifically. It's one of those things like, if this was book was written by me, I would never draw that. Mm. And that's one of the good things of working with someone like Brian Benz or like Rick Remand is like, you end up doing things that you would never do on your own. I would never draw them because, one, I don't like drawing likenesses at all. I really don't. And um, I usually stay away from direct homage like that. I prefer. I think it was clear enough already that right. <laughs> yes, he and uh, Moebius were pretty persuasive through the entire book. But uh, he asked and I thought it, make, it made sense and it was um, a fun thing to do in the end. It's not like they are not main characters or anything like that. Right, right. It, you know, you if you know, you know, uh, yeah. or you wonder at least. <laughs> um, <laughs> but what what what's interesting to me is like yes, like when you're reading the book, I I certainly felt Miyazaki and Mobius in in reading in reading the book. Now, is that just like a natural extension of who you are as a cartoonist? Uh, is that something that you were specifically chasing with phenomena? Yeah, it's pretty much that. It's like, that's the language that I speak. Because the designs came from me before we had the plot, you know, this is my beating heart pretty much in terms of design sensibilities. Yes, very much so. Like, the thing I I have to make this clear, it's not like I came up with stuff and Brian just came in the end and had a few words sure. like that at all. It's just that, he let me, he allowed me to take lead on this because he felt like it could be something very beneficial. And it's just a different way of working of the story because then I think it made his job incredibly harder because he now had to juggle with uh, a lot of stuff that um, he needed to glue together in terms of plot because visually they belong together because I made sure of that. But yeah, this is my like blood in my veins. This is what I what I enjoy really in terms of designs. 
the thing that Brian and I discussed heavily before was the tone of the story, because mm. otherwise we can go, you know, and the, there were some characters that I ended up pushing to the side and Brian never picked them up as well in terms of other characters or other places or other things that I suggested because it was um, either a bit more adult or a bit darker and it didn't fit the tone of the book. Now, you know, talking about wanting to work with a creator-owned project versus what you have done with uh, other publishers, uh, obviously there's a, a value in your head of what you want to give to a publisher versus what you want to own yourself. Uh, and mm -hmm. talking about phenomena, I mean, you're putting your soul onto the page. And I think, you know, I, I re I've read your other work and I, I feel like you're putting your soul into, uh, uh, you know, Young Justice as well. Um, but like it, this, does it feel like to you, like when you do something like Phenomena, it's more of a risk, but it must also be incredibly freeing in a way that doesn't occur uh, when you're working with one of the big two publishers. Yeah, like that's absolutely correct. Like I'm, whenever I got a, a job, it's work for hire or not. Like for me, the care that I put into the story is always the same. I never, you know, like never try to make it easy or oh this is for dc or marvel i don't need to care about backgrounds here or there that, that's that's never the the thing but the leeway that you have you know the freedom that you have is much smaller because one you have a script that's usually being approved by the editor so like the changes that you can put into it are, are minimal for example there was a bit on phenomena where i really liked what ryan had written i think it's for chapter two but when I was working on layouts, I, I thought this would work better if this bit was before, this bit was next to the end, you know, and I did a lot of cut and paste and I, I maintained everything that he wrote. I just did cut and paste and I can't, I could not do that on a Marvel or DC because one, we didn't have the time and two, like the editors would have to approve it and then they might not like it, uh, even if the writer was in agreement with, so of course, it's always the the, the key point here as well. So mm. on this one, yeah, a lot more freedom and like just not having to be concerned with what you're drawing in the background is the, it's a big, big, big thing for me because on Marvel or DC, you need, need to be very careful with what you put in the background. You cannot make references to pretty much anything. You cannot put a character smoking, for example. So you need to pay a lot of attention to suits and costumes and hairs and stuff like that. And on Phenomena, it's just, I can make up whatever I want. If I want a character, if Brian writes a character that does not appear on, on my sketches, for example, and he says, oh, now we need a character that, that does this. I can draw them like I want to. And I, I can draw them on the page if I want to. You know, I don't need anyone's approval. Brian doesn't need anyone's approval to, for the things that he's writing. So that, that's incredibly freeing. Yeah? So creator on comics is really, I can't see anything better than this. Um, one of the concepts I find the most interesting in the book is the idea of a story economy. And mm -hmm. I think about you going like, I want to do something creator owned. I want like this to be an extension of like, you know, my idea. Do you find yourself like kind of operating in a story economy where you really think of your ideas in terms of value? Oh yeah, absolutely. That was uh, Brian's idea actually, because, um, Brian had that it's it's not uh, I mean I can say it because he he, he talked about it many times as well yeah that uh, health scare like mm -hmm. the year before we met and um, he, he told me that he really felt like he wanted to do more stories so that's a lot of that stuff that you see on the book about the story economy comes from his also from his heart you know it's from from his it's like it's it's all imprint is there. Like he values story immensely. And that was always our concern with this. So um, yeah, you can say that is like a, a metaphor for what we do in the end. We sell stories and that's something that we felt, we both felt like keeps happening throughout our history as a society. The value of story has always been um, something very important for us, very the way to carry knowledge from for so many so many times and so many times and now on this on this book like we recover that idea of you telling a story and you know coming with news like in for example in the middle ages people were sitting around and then 
some foreigner would come in and with new stories, new things that would happen elsewhere, you know, the sense of adventure that would come with that person was enormous. So we really uh, put that into the book as well. And Brian Bendis yeah. is joining us right now. Oh, <laughs> better, better stop. Stop talking bad things about him. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, we'll stop saying bad things about Brian. Hey, Brian, how are you? Hi. Um, I don't. My calendar had this set up for a completely different day, even though you completely had it right on your invitation. So I apologize for that. No, that's okay. That's okay. I'm. I'm. I'm glad you're here. I'm glad no, you're here. No, actually, I, how long have you guys been recording? A little bit. A, a little bit. About twenty minutes. That's you know what though for this project that is it started with Andre that's it's it's a, that's a perfect uh, representation of the book. What I'd like to get to the bottom of is and I brought this up with Andre already, but the idea of a story economy th that stories have a value. Can can you talk a little bit about that idea? Yeah, no, that was a, a, a couple of things. And and number one, it's it, uh, you know we have a lot of people like writing reactions to the new rules and of the world that we live in today you know we are all of us like looking back even just a few years and seeing how things are very different and how people craft their story you know mm -hmm. you know edit their story to you know and and kind of like some truth falls away as, as everyone tries to like represent the the best version of themselves and um and it devalues this their 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 story a little bit in the long run you know or so so i thought it wouldn't be interesting if that's what your value was your value was actually your your story and it carries you through the world and the more experience you have the more value you have uh and uh and more interest in uh, and, and that that in itself is the entertainment of the world not screens did that, you know, like almost like campfire, like, yeah, what happened? And, uh, and we see right away, we say that people love true stories. They're mm -hmm. like, they're surrounded by fantastical. So they're, they're really into like the truth. And I, and, and we thought, could a world sustain itself that way? And it ends up, yes, because we used to, there's mm -hmm. actually that, you know, there were, there were eras of the world where that's how people got through life with uh, their story and their craft and whatever it is that they did. So we thought, wouldn't that be interesting if the world found itself in that position yet again? I also think it's interesting though, that there is this prevalent skepticism that exists in this world. People equally tend to believe that a place is real or believe that a place is legend. And I wonder if that's because the truth is like a little bit more precious and that you like keep it to yourself maybe, maybe you're like preserving the truth. Well, I, I no, I appreciate that. And and what you're also what we made a very conscious effort is and and as this series progresses with every page more and more like clues of how this came to be and why this came to be will reveal itself. But the what what we wanted to focus on is like something has happened to the world. We know we know this, we see this has happened, but we're coming into the world just as things are turning a little dark. <laughs> so we we thought like we wanted to like meet the characters just as there's some new threat creeping into the world. And, uh, and, and so that's what you're meeting. You're meeting the rules of the world just as they're begin beginning to be th truly threatened again, mm. which I knew we, we knew was um, harder to build, but it's, you know, actually not, it's not that different than like what you've seen in some of the star Wars cycles. Like mm. Mm. We're, we're meeting them just as the empire is about to get their shit together, just as the new order is about to build some goddamn thing. So even though this is a very different kind of sinisterness that's, you know, coming into our world and our world's been built very differently. There's no spaceships, there's no laser guns or anything like that. Um, specifically, that was very on purpose. Um, we're following some classic kind of storytelling ideas with these new ideas. Uh, we were talking a little earlier about the conversations that the two of you were having regarding tone. And I was wondering if you could go back to those early conversations that you were having before you really set on the phenomenon journey, phenomena journey of what you wanted the overall tone of this story to be. Well, some of it was, um, you know, we were, we started pre pandemic and then we're like building full on in some of the darkest days of the pandemic. It was some of the most, brilliant drawings that you saw 
uh, Andre Du. And, and also we were at that time though, surrounded by almost all of our peers who were putting together new material or you know everyone's home just like reacting to the world around them in one way or another and we saw like a lot of our peers were doing hard apocalyptic the world's coming to an end and this is how i feel about it work and and all of that is necessary and completely understandable uh and and i i said a number one well that that itch is definitely being scratched and I don't want to live there. I don't want to spend my time in an apocalyptic landscape. And because this, is, this comes with a little bit of experience, when you create a, a world, you're living in it. Like you guys are visiting, but me and Andre live there a lot of the time. So you realize like, oh, I would like to be a place that I'm delighted and surprised and shocked by, uh, but I want to be there. Right. And I, and I think that Andre and I's uh, desire to be in, in the presence of our characters, it like affects the like the, the tone of the book. So that that was number one. Like, here's a place that we want to be Here's Something has happened. It's not apocalyptic. It's something else. It's something a little different. And even that I thought we could push past some of the like obvious language of a, apocalyptic fiction the, it's stuff that we've just seen before and it's and nothing wrong with it again i'm not pooping on anybody's apocalyptic um party i i i, I totally i totally get it and i've done quite a bit of like apocalyptic fiction particularly in marvel when we're doing like age of ultron and stuff like that so i've i've been there and i've done it and i just wanted to see what else we could find and so that was number one and also there was i, I we very early on and i i just came across the note to andre was how much fun our characters are having they they really are enjoying themselves and like and going back to like star wars or the matrix and a lot of my favorite um world building sci-fi uh places everyone's having a great time even if they're scared out of their minds and they have no idea why why what is the force i don't know but isn't it cool like every everything about that was very inspiring to me and sometimes i do i feel it gets lost in some of the more modern things that we see this like just joy of presence like joy of you know, like people like like people are like i'll oh, still writing think pieces about why breaking bad was such a successful show and that was actually something me and andre talked about too because he was better call sawing all over the place during this and uh and it was like look how much fun they're having they're just having a blast tony soprano was having a good time even when things were all like the, they, they're really into it right so and i think people really like to be around that like it's mm -hmm. very it's a very interesting thing to keep you reading or watching and so so that that was a note like bolden's having a blast he's just having a great time even though there's something behind it and we're gonna get to it why is he here by himself or is his parents what's happening uh th that that th the actual moment that they're living in is very present and very fun my tendencies on when it comes to storytelling are darker and more violent than this book is and uh, i don't know why i just go there i have a very happy life so <laughs> I'm, not, I'm not like that at all but i like to explore this stuff in stories and some of my sketches like in the beginning we did like three or four sketches and brian was the one that pulled me to that brighter side of things and um i, I was telling them before brian that i had like some characters that we never used because they were more to the dark side and more to the grown-up side to the adult violent side of things and we went completely different and even throughout the book there are some things that um you you might uh, pick up on or not and that's one of for example no guns that's one thing that that's not a rule that we established but like the tone took care of that on its own and like full credit to brian to because he was completely correct on his assessment that the type of drawings that I was making and the type of story that we had both to tell was in that direction. And I was not seeing it in the beginning, like, like as clearly as he was. Mm. And again, it was, it, it was a mixture of reacting to what I saw being built around us, the world we were living in and what I, like, I literally like what I would have just appreciate like what would delight me. And, and I, and, and because, you know, I have kids of all different ages. So I'm like, 
analyzing a lot of material at different times. And, you know, my, my, my son just like for the first time ever, just, it came up to me and went, Hey, you know, I've never seen all the star Wars movies. I've never actually watched the Skywalker saga. Let's do it. And I'm like, God damn prequels. Here we go. And uh, um, no, but it was, it was interesting. Uh, and I did, I let him, I let him, I didn't say a word and I was let him watch and I'm watching the prequels and they're so angry, except for little Anakin for a while. There's just a lot of, oh, I'm so angry and I'm angry about this meeting and I'm angry about Anakin and I'm angry. like And, and then you get to the, the classic Star Wars and they're just delightful. They're just, ha- yes, the, there's, there's a war and there's kidnapping and there's a rescue, but they are having a blast and there's jokes and they work. And uh, just the tonal shift was amazing. Mm-hmm. And then I also like saw my, my son just visceral reaction to it like he sat and watched the prequels but he was jumping up and down during a new hope and i thought it would be like a slow trudge for him because it's a much slower movie Mm -hmm. and he was he was totally into it and it just it was such a reminder of like just like this joy joy of of doing your job is such a such a wonderful um storytelling device and sometimes it gets lost so yeah if if the people starring in the story are having fun that's going to be very inviting to some people i hoped so definitely i personally love talking ya and all ages fiction and a lot of times the conversation is focused on what you can't do in YA fiction like oh well you can't have the gore and you can't have the nudity like can you talk a little bit about what you can do in YA fiction that makes it so ex- exciting to create? Uh, yeah, agency. I, I think a lot of time, and again, I, I, I've had a couple of times where I accidentally found out I was writing what is considered YA material. <laughs> I mean, that's it, it happened with Miles. It happened with Naomi, where we didn't ever say the words YA while we were working on it. And then I go to Barnes and Noble a year later and there it is in the YA section. So I, I, I'm like, all right, it's YA. Let me think about this for a second. And, and a, a, a number one, it's, uh, and again, I, I, I love, I, I lucky I grew up a Spielberg kid. So I, I didn't know anything, but kind of Goonies mentality, which is, yeah, it's, it's our story. It's our agency. It's, uh, it, it's, it's having the kids own their moment and own the space that they're in. I, a lot of, People, not just children, often feel like they're trapped or they don't have agency over their moment. And when they read, when they're reading or enjoying their fiction, it's they're they're living vicariously through someone else's freedoms or choices or or uh, you know uh, just you know I'm gonna do whatever I want. You know, rebellion that that kind of stuff is very exciting to write very much in character for the age it's also it's fun to write characters that don't know what's wrong to do what you're doing like yeah that's a mistake i had i had that joy in with ultimate peter parker quite a few times where i'm like yeah we as adults know what he's doing is going to blow up in his face but he's 15 he don't know it yet and that's that's when you find out and so letting characters make mistakes letting them own their space let them have the just the joyful ignorance and arrogance of just, you know, getting through it. And I think we've all had that feeling where, yeah, you in youth did something where you look back and go, oh, that was just arrogance that you just thought you were, that was, that you thought that was a good idea. But uh, so writing all of that. And then also these are characters when you're writing YA, it's a lot of people learning lessons. They're, they're going through, a part of their life where they're learning something about themselves and growing into the person that they're going to be. And I think for a lot of us that sometimes feels like the most exciting time, like, like here, I, I don't know what I don't know yet. I'm going to learn it. I'm going to find out who I am. And these are all good. Yeah. And you don't need gore or any kind of, you, yeah, you I think don't there's need a lot to go dark focus. to do that. Yeah. yeah. There's a lot of focus on the stuff that you can do. And there is really like a taint of, a tainted view of what uh, um, YA really means or what it is. Like me and Brian, I don't think that we ever said that word to each other. We just like found the tone that we wanted to work on and that yeah, it felt naturally to to do it like it was. And as the story was progressing, it was clear, okay, what type of story we were doing. But like, this is not a, a, like a six-year-old story. This is a story of complexity no. and characters and all that. The only thing is that if you are 10 years old, you can read this book. But if you are 35, you can read it. Like it's 
it was very exciting for me to go through and create this story and i never felt like we were talking down to people or you know making them more stupid making the story more stupid than what it needs to be it's a story that we 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 created completely with with all with all intent and with all the themes that we wanted to talk about all the things that we wanted to put in there and there's nothing missing from it really yeah i mean yeah pixar and like marvel has shown for decades that you can tell emotionally complex story get to the heart of it scare people they have dangerous elements to the story without yeah. pu pushing it into a you know a space so dark it's hard to be there you yeah. know and, and that 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 that's where we wanted to take this i mean it's the star wars thing it's the miyazaki thing which we were talking about earlier also yeah yep yeah yeah, hundred percent. So, and and again, there's there's influence in these pages, both narratively and and visually, and and some of that is thematic as well, um, not just the, the visceral story, but like what we learned from that story and what that story told us, and then us trying to like take that lesson and apply it to a more modern idea and 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 keep it going. So we were discussing the guest appearances of Miyazaki, uh, Mobius, and Jack Kirby. Uh, we, just we, a couple we, people hanging around in the background. Yeah, That's all. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, Andre was saying that those influences, a lot of that stuff was what you wanted to put into the book. It's a bit of a hint of what phenomena is. Mm. It's not just a cheeky uh, bit of business. And, uh, and also, uh, I will say that I, I did at, like months afterwards go, oh, does, does now people are going to think this is heaven? It, 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 oh. it, it, it's not. Yeah. I never so, thought that. <laughs> I know. I, I'm, I meant to bring that up to you. Like, wait a second. Oh right? yeah. uh, I just find it interesting that um, in this like pro true story economy that the three elders are people of profound fantasy. Yes, uh, mm -hmm. I would argue, and it's one of our, our our basic ideas that the the creators of our fantasy, the creators of of our shared idea of what a fantasy, were actually creating the world that we wanted to live in versus the world we were living in. Mm. I like that. Yeah. Very Roddenberry. And we as a society want to live in the worlds we read, and not the one we're we're, we're birthed into. But then in Phenomena, the idea that true stories have the most value, it seems like fiction or fantasy has little value within the world of Phenomena. Mm -hmm. Oh, no, you should you should yeah. read what Ryan and I have done on, on volume two. <laughs> yeah. if you think that, that. By, by the way, that is the the one of the premises and themes of the second volume of which why it's such a miracle to say that we are we are well deep into at, at this at this point so we we know the answer to this but we'll talk about it next year got it, got it, got it. I, i'm so excited because one of the things we love talking about on comic book couples counseling is like stories point us to like a, a capital t truth as opposed to like facty facts i guess yes, yes. And, and well I said, perfectly said yeah oh, <laughs> um another element of the story that i find beautiful is like Bol Bolden repeatedly says, like, I have no people. My people don't have people. And you've already hinted that we're going to get to the bottom of like what happened to his people. But um, this seems to be revealing itself to be like a kind of a found family type adventure story. 100%. And, I, and I was wondering if you could talk a little bit about what having people means to you as just like as story creators, but also like just as human beings. Yeah, I, I mean, uh, this will be the, the least controversial thing I've ever said. I, I think uh, a, a lot of us uh, have found an incredible amount of ourselves in the family, not that we were birthed into, but the family we found ourselves, that, that our, our little clan that we, you know, created ar around ourselves. Uh, Andre and I, between the two of us, have 600 children, and with That's that true. creates... Mm -hmm you know a, a, a world of people around you uh that that you you're surprised and delighted by all the time and uh, i i i find myself writing to celebrate that every chance i can um it, it's just because i i think 
I, I know I found a joy and love in my life that I didn't think I, I had, I had in me. And I know like a lot of my friends and my, my, my people feel the same way. And I, I, it bleeds into my work all the time. Uh, and, and then when I see it, I laugh and then I keep going because this is I, like, I, I, it's never conscious that I'm like t- writing about this, but it's, it's, it, it makes me the happiest to describe it because it makes me the happiest in my heart. Uh, um, uh, yeah, I, I, I think that's the best way to describe it to me. I, I, I grew up, you know, with all, every fiction was about like a, a core family, the traditional family unit. And that's not what I grew up with. So when I, when I grew up <laughs> to an adult uh, and I, I found myself like writing the fictions of, of how I felt about the world which is you make your own family you know and 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 so yeah that's what's been going on literally since ultimate spider-man like for me it's almost the other way around i was born into a big family here in portugal we do tend to stay pretty close together like the extended family even i'm with my extended family every week on on the weekend so like the idea of being i think there's a lot of allure in certain stories that you have the lonely hero but that's mm-hmm. I don't think that on the long run, that's a good position to be in mm-hmm. for anyone, really. And like the idea of being without anyone is pretty unbearable, I think, for everyone, for me especially. And so like this little family that we are creating with our heroes, it just feels the right thing. And as they start to open up to each other and we learn more and more about them, I think it's more and more this idea of family will grow and it's one of my favorite aspects of the book really yeah but i think also i think bolden will discover like what a a tremendous responsibility it is also to have people like it's a tremendous blessing in our lives but there is like that fantasy element of just kind of being untethered like getting to to make your own choices yeah Yeah, there's the allure of that on stories the the lonely hero is like sounds a fantastic proposition on on paper right the lonely hero that goes from village to village rescuing people and whatnot but i think like you said the responsibility that comes from being with someone then gives you so much more in in the long run and that's what i think we get that on book one and i think that's on volume two we're going to get a lot more of that that was a great question. You know, I, I just I'm I'm very excited to be here. I this, I this is I was I was wondering when our paths would cross to talk, and Aww. I'm thrilled that it was this um this project that did it. Oh well, thank you, Brian. I you know I want to you know before we get out of here, I I want to return to the love that is in this book, the love within the characters, and the love between you two as creators, uh, the love that you're putting into this story. Andre was talking about how when you create something like Phenomena, it just feels different than when you work for hire. And oh, yeah. Brian, you've done every kind of story uh, imaginable. You've worked in every kind of uh, work for hire situation. But what does something like Phenomena feed you that uh, work for hire stories don't? But also, like, what does Phenomena feed you that, you know, you know, stuff like Jinx did it back in the day or uh, Powers or something along those lines. Well, they each, they each, each of those projects are like the, like the most important thing in my head at the time that I'm making them. So there, that, that's like who I was, like when I was making Jinx, that is who I was. And when I was making Powers, that is who I was all those years. So it, it, it's always a reflection of where you are in your emotional journey and your your creative journey at the same time. So, uh, so I work for hire has brought me an immense amount of joy. More than most have been able to experience. I've been able to build like whatever I wanted at both Marvel and DC. So I'm a very privileged, spoiled brat when it comes to that aspect of comics. Uh, and I and and I know it full stop. Like even the people that have the job that I had at the time may not have be having the freedom that I was given to just have at it and create whole events and stuff like that. So I'm really grateful 
for all of that. Um, and also the plus of that is um, these are beloved characters. Like, you know, Spider-Man comes with a fan base, you know, they comes with people who like them. So you're, you're meeting people halfway. They're, they're already there to be entertained by Spider-Man. Now show us something, right? Uh, whereas, um, and, and I have discovered over the years, the connection you have with people when you build something brand new and they engage with it is the most intimate mm. like like invisible connection you can have with uh, a, a stranger uh like with, with someone out there someone out there we've already experienced it with the just the few copies that are out there in the world right now that people read it and, and immediately connected with us and reached out because they knew how personal it was that you can feel on the page andre means every line of this right this mm -hmm. this is this is not a this is not a commercial job this is this is i'm showing you myself right and uh and so people feel that and they connect to it and they reach right back or they share it in with that thing so it 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 allows a, a deeper connection uh because it's a connection you're not looking for or expecting i and I, I don't mean to be too portland hippie on this but i i've experienced it's so much that like, and again, Alan Moore does a much better job of describing this because he sounds like a Hogwarts wizard, but it, there's a there, there's a genuine magic energy in these pages in the story that connects people and binds people together. Oh, I'm sounding like Yoda now. And, uh, and, and, and so bringing that forth and receiving that, whether it be a dirty crime book or a silly animal book or a fantastical new world that doesn't really have a genre that you can you know put, put onto it. it it that that kind of thing really connects you to people and it's really beautiful i hope that makes sense it's such a it weird makes total thing. sense okay. and there is literally not a safer place to say something really hippy dippy <laughs> Than comic book couples counseling. <laughs> yeah. No, I just I like I know like I, I have to be self aware that I am a I, I am a Portland resident of a certain age, and no matter what I'm saying, I will sound. And it, as soon as I start talking about the ethereal magic of storytelling, oh yeah, you're there, buddy. You're you're uh, you're you're Portland hippieing all over the place. So I just want to make aware that I'm aware of how I sound. <laughs> but it's it, honestly, I can't find another way to describe it or to ignore it. It's mm. it's a it's a hugely powerful presence in my life the the connection i have with people through story mm -hmm. whether marvel dc or or creator own it is profound and it goes on all day and if it was just miles it would be overwhelming and it's not so so it's a i and i try to describe it as best i can to younger creators who are looking for it or don't know where it is and I, yeah, it's, it's keep going. Be as truthful as you can. Be as intimate with your work as you can. Be be yourself because it can come back to you in a profound way, like a, a in a in a life defining way. Hmm. All right, Andre, I don't want to uh, go either without returning to the fact that Matilda is one of the characters of this book, named after your daughter. Can you? continue on what brian was just saying with that as a point of view uh just a little bit i can and the the my, my favorite thing about working with brian is that we don't think alike at all in most of things and this is one of them like is uh it's funny that um i'm much more analytical about these things you know and what works and what doesn't work on in a story and how it goes and uh at the same time, putting like 100% of passion into the page. And, but my decisions come from a more scientific point of view. But it's when we come together, me and Brian, is that all the investment in this, it's in the story. Like it comes more from a hearty place. And probably I'm thinking a bit more of it, probably because I love to draw it. So I, it needs to make sense panel to panel, page to page in terms of sequential images so i tend to go a bit more scientific about it but it's like what brian was saying about find your truth speak your truth it's like if you are a creator and you're telling a story if we could in a book like this me and brian could easily go into let's make just a fun thing a spectacle this and that we have the tools to do that but if you invest everything that you have in telling 
the story in storytelling from page one to the last page from in every panel if everything you add it's about the story you will speak your truth there there is no escape to that and i think that's in the end that's what you get from his approach and from my approach you will leave your soul on that page either you, you want it or not you will come out of it naked in front of everyone that's phenomenal it's both me and brian naked for for good and for for worse and i i andre what one of my favorite things about us is that how different we approach the pages and i've had this experience and continue to have it with um some of my other collaborators and some of my closest collaborators i mean i i think from the time you've spoken to alex maliva we could not be more different <laughs> Me and Alex yeah. we're working together. We're working together on a brand new thing right now, and we're uh, tackling the pages from a different planet. Like it's in it, uh, but I I know in my heart and have experienced that uh, it's not guaranteed, but it almost always brings something magical. When yeah, if we're if we're if we're all looking at it the same way, all right. But if we're coming at it with different things that we want the audience gets both things that we want like like you know and that's that's the thing that i i get most yeah like i, I was telling that before you joined that some of the stuff that i drew on the book like i would never draw that if i was writing this but because you were writing this and we we are creating this together there are things that are in there that would never be if i was alone or if you were working with another artist so that's the beauty perfectly of, said that's exactly it and, and we oh, always yeah. yeah in collaboration are reaching for those like like yeah make me something i'm not normally i and i and i because i i i used to draw i know what i'm like on my own i I know what my strengths and weaknesses and whatnot it's not it's not an abstract idea so when i'm teamed up with someone who's bringing out something in me i know i would not have gotten to on my own oh, I'm, you know i'm emotional about it the whole time one thing that was 100 brian and it for most people will probably think it was me it's the black and white thing this is brian's mm -hmm. suggestion because I was, I always loved doing half tones and all that stuff. It never occurred to me to suggest that this book would, could be black and white. It was Brian, and I immediately said yes because I really wanted to do this, and I it, didn't know that I wanted to. Yeah, and and for me, you know, I grew up at a time where I came in through black and white comics, and at the time, you're all you're told is how well one day you'll grow up and do color comics like that. They're they're they're, they're not like completed or something right and i was working in full like black and white language i was not like you know hopefully someday will someone come out and finish this book for me but uh uh so having watched our industry evolve to not thinking like that anymore was so delightful to me i'm just so happy that i lived long enough for not to see that happen through manga manga and uh uh, sorry, my Cleveland accent popped in there for a second. Uh, <laughs> manga and uh, and uh, like uh, you know, Walking Dead. There's so many uh, books that succeeded uh, in their black and white language that, and then you know, looking at Andre's work, which always looks good, both in black and white and color. But there's something visceral in the black and white that I just it just really struck me as uh, boy oh boy. And I and I know it's a swing. I know it's different than the other YA books that are out there. But I think that 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 that's a positive in a way like you know i walk into powell's here in portland and there's a lot of uh ya books that are very much following a couple of like you know a lot of people doing Raina, a lot mm -hmm. of people doing the yeah. Raina bit and that's and i get it wholeheartedly uh but I, a number one i'm not into like you know i we want to do our own thing but b also i think some of that audience would evolve to finding other kinds of ways to see the story and that's kind of we thought we could maybe be that book for some people well lisa and i have been reading both of your works for a while you know righteous thirst of vengeance is one of my favorite books on the stands um i'm pretty sure brian that you made lisa a rabid comic book fan mm -hmm. through ultimate spider-man right oh right. i didn't know that that's so yeah. nice to hear oh I, I wasn't even all right that's great thank yeah, you yeah uh, like when we started like when we got married i had read some comics but i never really stuck to it but like he owns so many like volumes of stuff and i'm like you know i have to be curious well like where should i start and i started with ultimate spider-man and then um, and then Peter Parker died and then I cried and then I stopped reading comic books for a little while, but then I came back. 
<laughs> Wait, are, I, you're my Twitter feed. <laughs> <From Hawaii. laughs> I, I had not accustomed myself to that kind of heartbreak. Don't worry. I'm very uh, hardened and jaded now. And I know that my characters still exist even when they change. Uh, well, I'm glad I could be part of your uh, calloused heart. <laughs> but with all that being said, like when we opened up Phenomena, we went, oh, shit. Like just from like the first page, it it looked like nothing that either of you two have done before. Mm -hmm. And Thank I think you. you get this book into people's hands and they're going to just lose their minds over it. I appreciate that. I have some I had some personal uh, ideas of where I wanted to go, like on my personal journey here, like where I, I wanted to go. I've seen saw. um some of my heroes, not people in comics, but I saw a lot of my heroes uh, repeating themselves a little bit, and I fully understood what goes behind it. I even, even like, you know, there's 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 a comedian who keeps like rewriting this joke, and I'm like, you already did that joke perfectly. Mm -hmm. Stop trying to, but not to them. They they don't think they did. I get that totally, but but I know that. I just I I found myself going, yeah, th this is you doing you. You gotta you gotta push further and and i wanted to try that and, and andre's partnership completely allowed that opportunity so thank you for noticing because yeah th that and enjoy operations and even what we're doing on pearl like i'm like just trying to uh evolve and 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 find new things in my work everywhere i can without sounding to head up my own asses but you know that's where we live sorry <laughs> yeah, that's a good thing to to work with the with different people i think that you get that whether you want it or not you're going to be dragged yeah. into something that you're not 100 sure like when i team up, teamed up with brian we didn't know what we were going to do and when i teamed up with rick we didn't know what we were going to do we discussed it both times like a few months before I started working really and we decided on things that were not the the idea that we both had that we were going to do so that was a lot of fun because of that a lot of discovery See, I love too, Andre. I don't know if you talked about it before I got here. I love that you were uh, going back and forth between phenomena and righteous. Like, I love like the a number one. You got to show off like how versatile you are. I mean, nothing will ever speak to like look how versatile this is. And like, like it felt like uh, to me like uh, like when Spielberg was doing like uh, Schindler's List and Jurassic Park in the same three month period. I'm like, yeah, I am. I am both of these things. And uh, uh, that you accomplished both perfectly. And also I liked that uh, uh, every time you and Rick went down some like dark, bloody hole, I know I, I will be here to, to, uh, you know, get, light. To the, uh, <laughs> yeah, I, I like, I just like the, the, the contrast of the two projects so much. Yeah. And it's, it's because of basically it's a scheduling um, like thing that makes the, both of the books come around because I was telling them that I drew, phenomena and then i jumped into righteous third and now back to to phenomena but while i was doing one i was not meddling with the other at all and i just switched like that i i finished the righteous third and the next day i was working on phenomena ag again and this, it was like no time had passed between volume one and two for me and when i switched to righteous third after volume one it was like i my my head works like that i just just switch it's, completely and no problems at all and but it's pretty good to be able to jump i guess that when i finished phenomena i was dying to do something a bit darker and now i'm i was dying to come back to the light again so that was easy to go from one to the other perfect yeah that's amazing yeah well we're excited to have three years of phenomena in our future here book one's about to drop uh, and we're going to have links in the show notes where they can find the book and where they can find you. But in case those folks don't uh, read my links in the show notes, uh, can you tell them where they can continue this conversation with you online? Oh yeah. Listen, Substack. Um, I have a, I have a Substack that's the best way to, for me to communicate with everybody. And we have some really delightful surprises coming into that space in the next month or so. So definitely keep an eye out on that, but um, we're on Twitter, we're on Instagram, but, uh, but Substack's where it's at. And listen, this is uh phenomena is a book published by Abrams comics art. So it is available wherever books are sold around the mm -hmm. world. So, you know, go to your local bookstore. That's always my, my, 
my thing is to hit some local mom and pop store and pre-order, but you, you can go anywhere from that to Amazon and you'll be able to get it. Yeah, absolutely. Same for me. I mean, just type my name into Twitter, into Instagram. I'm there. I have a website. I have wonderful conversations when uh, Righteous Thirst was being published uh, both on Twitter and on Instagram. People just coming around, talk about the story, what was going on. I cannot wait for people to start talking to me. Yeah, my, my 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 Twitter is a hot mess because Andre dropped a bunch of art yesterday. <laughs> and uh, People, I, I I guess most, a lot of Portuguese people just uh, talking to me. In the, oh yeah, that's what, that's what was a back and forth between me and the Portuguese guy no it's fantastic it's it's, but i'm 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 assuming it's all pleasant yes it is okay it it looked all pleasant i didn't didn't see any like portuguese word for sock you know it looked okay so i don't don't, also andre not to embarrass andre i spent a lot of time showing what andre's done here to our peers who sit there quietly and have a lot of emotions uh, like it's it's wonderful, and I don't I don't mean I, this is a little embarrassing, Andre, but it is wonderful to oh. see. I, I have some people in my life who are real art snobs, like real art snobs. I won't name them, but because they're 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 known people, but they are art snobs, and they sit with Andre's work and have that uh, feeling. I think that some musicians had when Jimi Hendrix took the stage at Woodstock. They're like, oh, oh shit. Okay, well I guess I I guess I better go draw my backgrounds. That listen, you know by now that you cannot embarrass me, but that might be a bit too much. But I'll take it. You know, uh, I love the logics. <laughs> I don't know, Andre. That's what you know. That's the experience that Lisa had as readers. Like it mean, you know, these pages. Yeah. Like you put them out on Twitter, people go like, "Oh, what's this then?" And they're they're paying attention. And when the book comes out, people are going to really flock to it. Yeah, um, and uh, uh, you'll you'll see, and you've seen it. The whole book looks looks like this. It's not yeah. that, that's not. Oh, here's one good spread and a bunch of talking heads. It's it's a it's a beautiful book, and I'm just proud to be anywhere near it. No shortcuts, that's for sure. Uh, gentlemen, thank you so much for spending uh, time with us here at Comic Book Couples Counseling. It's a real privilege and an honor to chat with you, especially about a book that is just so darn incredible. And uh, we look forward to having more conversations, especially as book two and book three come out. And uh, if we ever want to have a have an Ultimate Spider-Man conversation, let me know. Dude. I, I, I literally had no idea you guys were 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 into it. So that's that's amazing. I would love to. Don't tease. I'm not. That no, was that was sincere. We're gonna have it then. We're gonna oh have God. it. And you're gonna hear Lisa cry. Aww. We'll save that for the next episode. We'll the Lisa next openly episode. weeping. Uh again, thank you. Take care. Enjoy the rest of your day. Absolutely. Thanks so much for this. Really appreciate it. I have thank a quick you. question. Oh, oh. sure. Uh, was the comedian? We're not no. including this in the podcast. No, no, no who no, was it? it? I'm a big stand-up nerd. No, okay, uh, but... Lisa, yes. you jumped right on the closing. Yeah, yeah. So yeah. we have to do the closing. I, just, I saw again. people starting to close their laptops. I just want to. <laughs> but no, like you, like you start talking about comedy. I'll let. I, 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 that's where I live. So I'm just going to try. I just want to do like the last, like yeah, yeah. yeah. You say gentlemen, gentlemen and then you say a thank you, and yeah. And then just say thank okay, you. Goodbye. You're setting right. me up here. You know I'm gonna fuck them up. Right. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, again thank you guys this is too much um all right here we go uh gentlemen thank you so much for joining us on comic book couples counseling it's been a true privilege and an honor to chat comics with you and we look forward to doing it again when uh book two and book three of phenomena come out great hey lisa have you have you watched the george carlin documentary i have i have it's it's really wonderful (laughs) really great it's really unique document all right thanks everybody (laughs) thank you (laughs) <laughs> awesome that's a great <laughs> uh, Andre Brian thank you so much thank you uh, let's talk again all right yes absolutely and again I apologize for the lateness that is that oh. is against my religion I, I no we we used it to uh extend this conversation longer than before so we perfect we appreciate yeah. it all right we'll talk soon all right take care bye bye okay, bye everyone bye. bye bye thank you Andre thank you Lisa, I was just trying to wrap up that conversation succinctly and kindly, and you jumped on my (laughs) outro. Well, I was afraid that after, like, so when we do the podcast, there are generally two goodbyes where we do an on-air goodbye and thank you. And then 
we stop recording. And then there's an off air. And then there's an off air, like thank you and kind of like some like um, housekeeping type stuff. Yeah, I thought that's what we were doing. But sometimes creators don't know that there's going to be two thank yous because we, do, we don't tell them. Why we should tell them. And um, <laughs> as we were finishing the conversation, the, like the on air goodbye, Brian Michael Bendis looked like he was going to like shut his lap. I thought, I thought maybe he thought that the... The talking was done, yeah. and I really wanted to know if we were thinking of the same stand-up comedian, and which we were not. No. 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 We were thinking no. about two completely different things, and that's okay. That's okay. But yeah. we did get to have a little bonding over being stand-up comedy fans. I loved Bendis saying, like, so I was like, okay, we're just going to do this over again. All right. And then Bendis is like, oh, I'm going to fuck with you. <laughs> <laughs> and he did that. And that George Carlin doc is great. And it is great. So now I'm wondering, because there's a, there was a George Carlin series. Is that the one he's Yeah, yeah. He's talking okay. about the HBO one. It yeah. just got nominated for an Emmy. Yeah, cool. Or won an Emmy. I think it won an Emmy. Who cares about the I, Emmies? Not me. Mm -mm. I, I don't know if the Emmys have happened. For me, an E got, E stands for Eisner. So. <laughs> Yeah, <laughs> uh, that was a really fantastic conversation. The other like weird moment that I could not handle was Bendis complimenting the podcast. Mm. And I had to throw away that compliment so quickly. It made me so nervous. Yeah, yeah. He was like, oh, I've been waiting for our paths to cross ah, or whatever. And I, my my heart and love tank <laughs> opens up like I'm ready to receive this compliment. Nope. And Brad shakes his head like, no, nope, he didn't mean nope, it. I'm like, how dare, how, dare, how dare you sweep your leg underneath? those words of affirmation oh but I, I I don't know I I really cherish that conversation mm -hmm. I hope to have more conversations with both of these creators I want to talk with Andre about righteous thirst of vengeance yes just reread the first trade of that oh my god that comic is so not phenomena it's great I but love, it is not phenomena I love their conversation about finding the balance or finding the story with their two very different voices yeah. because like I think this is my first I haven't Red Righteous Thirst for Vengeance. Yeah, no, this is your first time with him. Yeah. So, like, I, I was an Insta fan, but then to find out that he has this completely other ultra violent side to him made me so curious. And the fact that he had to, like, balance that and tone that down in order to tell a story with Bendis, like, that's interesting well, to me. Well, their whole conversation about how they have polar opposite thinking and how, you know, Bendis, you know, with the whole elders situation, and sorry for not warning you folks that we did spoil the elders, uh, but that whole elders situation and how he never would have illustrated those creator cameos, but Bendis encouraged him to do so and how that like unlocked something for Andre, I, I, I found fascinating. And mm -hmm. I, I would like to return to that conversation when book two comes out. I also find it really interesting when people are super good at something that they don't like to do, how um, Andre was like, oh, I hate drawing likenesses. Yeah. And I'm like, well, you just drew three very recognizable human beings. Yeah. So, um, yeah. Why don't you like if I was that good at something, I would love doing it, uh, I imagine. Can you believe that he does 20 pages of gray tones in a week? I what? I can't I can't draw, so yeah. I can't imagine it. <laughs> I like I thought they were going to say like we started this comic in 2011, mm -hmm. but 2019, that's madness. A machine. Uh, machine so bravo to both of them uh i am so excited for the rest of the world to read phenomena the golden city of eyes out next week from abrams comic arts which is hard to say abrams comic arts it is hard to say and i've had to redo it a couple times yeah both of us have but we now have it on record that andre said he would come back to talk about righteous thirst for vengeance yes. and bendis will come back for ultimate spider-man lisa unbelievable prepare those tear ducts <laughs> uh now next week i am going to be going to anaheim for the d23 expo covering that for film school rejects 
I will be leaving Lisa behind, Ooh. sad, but I'll only be gone for a few days. And we already have our next episode recorded and ready to go. It is another Creator Corner conversation with Matthew Clickstein about his new book, See You in San Diego, an oral history of the San Diego Comic-Con International. Yes, you thought we were done <laughs> celebrating Comic-Con? No, you are wrong. More Comic-Con celebration in your future. Mm-hmm. Comic-Con is like Christmas. We keep it in our hearts all year round. That's right. It's a really uh, delightful conversation. And, and as you will hear, it is about a lot more than Comic-Con. Mm -hmm. It is about comics as an art form and fandom. Uh, Jack Kirby is a huge figure in this conversation. Folks like Scott Shaw are huge figures in this conversation. I think if you are a fan of comics, you will want to get See You in San Diego and Oral History of San Diego Comic-Con. Over on our Patreon, we're continuing our Sandman issue by issue coverage. We just concluded our chat about Sandman issue number 42, the second part in our Brief Lives storyline. And that episode is two hours, and we tell <laughs> the entire story of Brad's fake heart attack. <laughs> oh man, we didn't even talk about my uh, heart attack scare, which turned out to be just indigestion, but uh, it was a game changer for Brad here. And on the Patreon feed, we'll also have conversations with more comic book creators like Dave Chisholm, talking about his his new book, Enter the Blue, which is from Z2 Comics and also super rad. Those of you who have been following us on Twitter already know that our next couple session is going to be served on the half shell. Yeah! Turtle power. Turtle Power! Our next session will be with the Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles. We're not discussing romances. We're discussing sibling relationships. Romances! Romances. But in general, siblings, because why gender it? Yeah, yeah, yeah. And have you decided what our first arc is going to be? Yes, for our first episode, we're going all the way back to the beginning with Kevin Eastman and Peter Laird's first seven Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles comics, which are collected in volume one of the Ultimate Collection. When I asked you, I was not entirely sure you had decided. I have decided. Okay, good. Now, uh -huh. since I'm speaking it into a microphone, before speaking into a microphone, I had not decided. <laughs> and we reserve the right to change our minds. That's right. Uh, but Lisa, who is going to be our love expert or our sibling expert? Which sibling love is? Si it's totally is, is love. love. Yeah, so love expert. Brad right? might not know it, but he does not know all the kinds of love. I'm an only child. Yeah, that's right. You're going to get some insight. So who's our love expert? Don Hubner, PhD. And the book is The Sibling Survival Guide, Surefire ways to resolve conflicts, reduce rivalry, and have more fun with your brothers and sisters. All right. It sounds like it's going to be uh, a kid's book. Um, the cover is cartoony. It's illustrated by Kara McHale. But um, there's a note to parents and caregivers. I think it is. I don't know. I haven't read it at all. Okay. Or done any research. All right. And I reserve the right to change my mind. <laughs> that, that sounds great. <laughs> we will let the fates decide what our next episode is truly going to be. So in the meantime, where can our listeners send their words of affirmation to you? You can find me on all social medias at MouthDork. If you have words of affirmation for our logo, you can send them to Aaron Prescott at A Cool Hand Fluke. And if you have some words of affirmation for our radical banner art and show posters, send them to Karen Charm at Karen underscore X-Men fan. Lisa, where can our listeners send their words of affirmation to you? I am always accepting words of affirmation at Sidewalk Siren on Instagram and Twitter. If you'd like to spend more quality time with us, you can subscribe to us on Podbean, Stitcher, YouTube, Google, and Apple Podcasts. If you'd like to get exclusive, you can join our Patreon, where you'll get more content, including weekly bonus episodes. If you'd like to reach out and touch us electronically, you can email the podcast, cbccpodcast at gmail.com. You can visit our website, comicbookcouplescounseling.com, or follow us on Instagram and Twitter at cbccpodcast. You can give us a gift of five stars on Apple Podcasts, and if you'd like to do an act of service, why not write a review of the show while you're there? We are fluent and receptive in all five love languages. It really warms our hearts and helps the pod. So until next time, friends, keep your love tank full. And your psychic rapport open. Doopy doopy. Bum, bum, ba -da, bum, bum, ba -da, ba. But our couch is all fluffed and ready. I, I, get, I got it. <laughs> it is fluffed and ready. It's fluffed and ready, it's Lisa. It's fluffed and ready. 
Angela and Sarah have finally vacated after after three episodes of canoodling on our couch. I don't know where this is going. Who's our next? Who's our next couple session? Do we want to keep that? 